All right, everybody, we're going to get started. It is October 27, 2021. Thanks, everybody, for uh, being here with me tonight. Um, very excited about tonight. David Trainer um, has a lot of experience, very well respected on Wall Street. So what I'm going to do first is I am mostly excited tonight about because what we normally do has to do with mostly reading charts, reading order flow, reading the tape and that kind of stuff. And we mix news into the equation. Obviously, now earnings season, there's a ton of volatility. But what I'm most excited about tonight is what's David's specialty. And we're very privileged to actually have him here tonight because he's one of the best at what he does, which is a different level of just reading earnings per share and saying, wow, that company had good earnings today or revenue was up 1%. We're going to go a lot deeper than that tonight. And um, I first want to uh, go through David's website just a little bit, show you where he's been in the media, what the website's all about. Uh, and then I'm going to let David take it from there. David's going to introduce his... Um, expertise, I guess there's no other way to put it, uh, go over a few things to teach us tonight, and then we're going to open that up for uh, Q&A. So I'm going to actually just show David's site so everybody has a link to where we're referencing tonight, and then uh, we'll take it from there. So first thing I want to do is David's site is New Constructs, um, and you can see here it's um, research is essentially what it does. David specializes in fundamental analysis, and I'm probably not doing enough justice. I'm sure David will do that tonight. Uh, we're going to talk about some of the stuff that's on here that's research, but I wanted to first introduce, um, obviously, tonight we're talking to David Trainer, all right, the CEO of New Constructs. And just to give some credibility for where we are right now, where we're speaking, you can see that David is uh, frequently asked by some of the most respected places around in our industry, Wall Street, as well as finance, Barron's, CNBC. Uh, I believe this one was Cheddar. This is Bloomberg. TD Ameritrade. Uh, so David's credibility goes without, um, without saying. We're going to get a little bit tonight into, this is just one small sample of the site. You can see I, uh, these are some of the stocks that I've been researching myself lately based on what we trade, based on some earnings. You can see the valuations in here, which I think is what David's going to get into in a little bit more detail tonight. Maybe a little bit what discounted cash flow analysis means, how what he does is different uh, and then we're going to break down a couple of stocks that I know in our community um, that are stuff that we talk about and trade quite a bit. One of them is unattractive. One of them is attractive. And um, David's going to walk us through exactly uh, what that means. So I'm pretty, you can tell that <laughs> you can tell I'm pretty jazzed up for tonight because this is a little different than what we normally do. Um, so everybody, welcome David Trainer. Um, I know we're going to have a lot of people that are still commuting or can't be here tonight. So David, just so you know as well, the replay of this will go out to um, a, a very large audience. So the replay of this uh, is going to get a lot of follow-up as well. So that's David Trainer, everybody. I'm going to hand it off to him. We're going to do a lot of back and forth. If anybody needs anything, I'll, I'll document any questions if you happen to be speaking, and then we'll come back to them, and then we'll kind of have a formal uh, Q&A towards the end, all right? Sounds great. Okay. All yours, Dave. Great. Uh, yeah, I'll start with the homepage here, and... Um... You know, quickly, just to, to build on what Pete said, um, thanks very much. I'm honored to be with you guys and uh, really happy to share our technology with you all. Uh, think about uh, New Constructs as sort of the, the wheel for Wall Street. Uh, instead of having to do a bunch of work to read through 200, 300, 500 page filings to understand the profits of businesses, we've done that with technology. And we do that now better than even the humans do that. And it's not just me saying that. Uh, it's our stock picking track record. I think Pete uh, went through some of the, the media accolades. But if you're on our homepage, which I put into the chat, you click on this, this button here and it'll take you to a series of articles on how highly we ranked for picking stocks. Uh, but my most, my, I think the most impressive section here is this proof that our research outperforms. Uh, this, this link here will take you to a summary of a 60 page paper written by professors from Harvard Business School and MIT Sloan, who systematically and mathematically prove that our earnings research is materially superior to everything else that's out there. That's the research you can get from Capital IQ, S&P, Refinitiv, FactSet, whatever else is out there. Uh, this paper proves that there is significant bias in the Wall Street estimates around earnings. 
Uh, and the big difference between our numbers and everyone else's numbers is that we are screening out all the unusual gains and losses that managers and Wall Street analysts use to manipulate earnings. Why do they manipulate earnings? So they can manipulate stock prices. I'm a former Wall Street analyst. I was actually on Wall Street before the tech bubble. And back before the tech bubble, people did a lot of this kind of research. And during the tech bubble, they quit doing it. And I can tell you why, because when I was at Credit Suisse, it was the number one tech investment banking firm in the world. The number one tech IPO firm during the tech IPO bubble. So I met with some of the most successful, successful in quotes, successful for them because they made hundreds of millions of dollars as analysts selling IPOs, not necessarily successful because they had good stock picks. But I met these guys and they told me flat out that for the stocks they like, they have purposely lower estimates so that it's easier for the company to beat the number. Because stocks go up when they beat the number. I'll repeat that. Analysts have lower estimates on purpose. They understate earnings estimates for companies they like. So it's easier for the company to beat the number because stocks go up when they beat the number, right? Vice versa on the stocks they don't like. So the next question is, what stocks does Wall Street analysts like? Any guesses? The stocks are the companies that are losing the most money. Why? Because those companies have to sell more debt and more equity to raise the cash to cover their losses. What is the poster child for this? Tesla, <laughs> right? Losing tons of money, having to raise lots of capital. And so the Wall Street analysts queue up to say good things and have good, good um, ratings on a company that's going to make them tons of money, right? For every billion dollars, or like say, I think the last capital raise, $7 billion of capital that Tesla raised, Wall Street made hundreds of millions of dollars on that sale. So what's the problem? The problem is one that most people don't recognize. And that's that the data you're looking at with respect to earnings is flawed. And professors from Harvard Business School and MIT Sloan have proven this. So you don't have to trust me. And I've got a summary here on our homepage that uh, goes through and quotes specific pages in this paper uh, that speak to all the issues. And the problems with the data include omissions, errors, and biases. Uh, the, the materiality of the flaws is very large, as proven here. And if the fact that it's written by Harvard Business School and MIT Sloan professors is not enough, their paper was actually accepted by the journal Financial Economics, which is a top peer-reviewed journal in the world. So being accepted for publication in a peer-reviewed journal means that it's accepted fact that everything in this paper is true by all the top experts in the world. So um, if you don't believe our data is better based on that, I, I kind of know what else to tell you. Um, <laughs> and the next thing I want to point out is that our models are better. And this is a paper by Ernst & Young that speaks, speaks specifically to how not only do we gather data better, but we know how to crunch the numbers better. And that makes sense, right? The people actually know how to do the work, right? Know how to go and get the data needed to do the work right. And I think that's something that makes the new constructs really unique. We're not just about technology to go and get the to go and get data faster, better, cheaper. We're about building models that are answers, right? Because better answers leads to better stock picking, which is the last study here, which is from the Kelly School of Business, which shows that our robo analyst driven ratings are superior to human analyst ratings, right? So to be clear, the data that drives better models, results in better ratings, uh, which also results in better stock picks. I wanted to touch on another link here. The In the News link here is an even better one, Pete, for looking at all the coverage we get in terms of the media. Um, and look, the, the media likes what we do, even though we're, we're sort of a counter message, we're not always bullish like a lot of folks are. Uh, and I'm not here to say the fundamental data is the beginning and end for research uh, and stock picking. But I think it's an important data, data point for ensuring that you don't get too far away from reality. You don't get too much into risk uh, where you don't realize you're taking risk. Pete, did you have something you wanted to add? Um, yeah, I actually wanted to bring back Tesla for a second. Obviously, that's the poster child for um, the electric vehicle industry right now. In what ways, again, keeping it within the context of the first time introducing the 
conversation. In what ways are people misinterpreting what's going on with Tesla? Yeah, I think um, Tesla is a great company, right? And Elon Musk has done a lot of great things. But there's a difference between a good company and a good stock. That's a powerful statement. Right. And, and what that means is that you can have a great business, a great idea, a great car, right? Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it has an infinite value. At some point, what you pay for a product, no matter how good it is, uh, has to equate with how much value you get from it. So what we're seeing with, with, with Tesla, the real issue with Tesla is not so much that it's a bad, a bad business or a bad company. It's that the valuation implies that they will sell more cars than the entire electric vehicle market is expected to be by 2030. They have to be 100% of the electric vehicle sales um, to justify the valuation at its current levels, right? So we're not saying that, hey, Tesla's not going to be successful, that Tesla cars aren't going to be around. We're just saying that the valuation has gotten out of touch with the reality of the underlying business. And that's risk, right? And look, we've been wrong about that for a long time. Clearly been wrong about that recently. Uh, and a lot of people don't care about fundamentals. And I think with Tesla and other meme stocks, you know, fundamentals don't always matter, certainly in the short term. And I'm not here to say that, that, that there's a big major reckoning coming around the corner, corner. Who knows how long this could last? I just want to equip our clients with a sense of the risk, the fundamental risk anyway, in the story. You may be comfortable with that risk, but at least you know it. Can you go over the columns that you have there, Dave, just to give everybody an idea of what's, what's in the sheet there? Yeah, this is a perfect example of, of uh, you know, how to look at a good company and a good stock. So the overall rating here for Tesla is, is neutral, right? Uh, quality of earnings. This is whether or not it's a good company. Is it profitable? Quality of earnings is good for Tesla, right? They've recently become profitable, you know, even when you exclude regulatory credits uh, and their returns on capital are getting to decent levels, right? But here's where you get to the point where it's not really good stock because the valuation implies so much profit and so much growth. Um, look, the free cash flow yield is, is negative, right? Uh, because they don't actually generate free cash flow. Uh, they're still building out the business, right? And that's costing more than the actual cash flow coming in. And cash flow, free cash flow is different from profits because free cash flow takes into account the capital expenditures. Profits don't, don't so much. We look at depreciation as, as, as a proxy for sort of long-term capital spending. And, and that's going to mean that free cash flow punishes growth stage companies a little bit more than mature companies. Nevertheless, an important metric. The price to economic book value ratio is the price to the no growth value of the business. And if you look at Tesla's value based on its existing cash flows, those cash flows are not large enough to cover its liabilities, right? So there are huge uh, stock option and debt liabilities that dwarf the cash flows of the business today. And a lot of the reason those stack, the, 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 the stock liabilities are so large is because they've given out, given out so many options and the value of the stock has gone up to the liability so, so huge. So in some ways, the higher the stock goes, the bigger the liability because the company pays so much in options. And that's something most people aren't aware of. That's one of the, that's one of the stones we like to turn over. And then market implied growth appreciation period. Pete, we, when you and I were talking before, you were saying that you know, our reverse discounted cash flow model is something you wanted me to be able to spend a little time on. And, and and I don't like to always do this in our first couple of meetings because it's rather complicated, but I'll jump in real quickly and I'll trust that you'll pull me out of the deep end if I get too, too much into it. But <laughs> Sounds good. We actually have some smart people on here. Aldo, Minvai, a lot of people in our community. I'm going to give them the benefit of the doubt that they'll be catching up very quickly if it's something that's new. Yeah, sure. And we've got a really detailed blog post on all this stuff that I'm happy to share with folks as well. But the, the basic premise behind a reverse discounted cash flow model is that We'd rather be a critic of a fortune teller than a fortune teller, right? Instead of having to predict the future, I'd rather just like critique where the future is being predicted by somebody else. And with the stock market every day, right? Have Mr. Market, who's predicting the future. If you believe that a stock price represents the present value of the cash flows available to the owner, 
or the present value of the cash flows that will come to the owner of that share of stock. And that's a fundamental principle of the stock market. Um, again, if you don't care about fundamentals, you don't care about that principle. But that's the fundamental principle that the stock market and most you know, investing theory over the last 100 years is based on. The meme stock stuff is a, is a, is a more recent phenomenon and it, it kind of uh, blows in the face of all that. But if you believe that a stock price should be somewhat equal to the present value of cash flows that will come to the owner of that, you can use that stock price to reverse engineer what the business has to do in the future to justify its valuation, right? That's where I got to that analysis that says stock, Tesla's got to sell, sell more cars by 2030 than the entire electric vehicle market is expected to be in 2030. Because what we do is we run our, our, our future cash flow model out into the future, and we look at imply we look at future margins, and we give them margins as high as as, as Toyota. We say we'll give Tesla credit for being as profitable as Toyota, which I think is a stretch, especially for a company growing this fast. Um, and Toyota is one of the most efficient companies of all time. We'll assume they need zero capex, right? And then we run that model out, right, as far out into the future as we need. I think growing at like twenty percent or twenty five percent compounded annually. We could open up one of these models and take a look here. Uh, and we see how we look and we run that out for as long as it takes for our discounted cash flow model to produce a stock price equal to the current stock price. And then from there, we can see what the implied revenue is based on a 7% margin and zero capex, right? Giving them credit for nothing. They need no capex. Um, and that, then we divide that implied revenue number by the average selling price of the vehicles. And that tells us how many vehicles they need to sell in that last year of profit growth that's required to justify the stock price. And that's and how growth, we get to the number. Just to clear that up, Dave, if I want to make uh, clarity, the growth appreciation period is the time that it would take to justify the current price, correct? That's right. That's the number of years of profit growth that you need in a discounted cash flow model to generate a value equal to the current stock price. So we call that the market implied growth appreciation period. That's this column here. That's more than 100 years for Tesla in our base case scenario. Base case scenarios are based on consensus expectations. Now, I can, I can, in my, I can build my own model in our system, right, and look at multiple different scenarios. Like for here, I've got an optimistic, right? And this one, you can see the values going up really fast. And these are the implied values per share for Tesla. Is my screen big enough? Yes. Great. Uh, and so this, in this one in 2040, right, the model gets to 965 bucks and 97 cents a share. And, and that's, that's the, the, this model works in a way that, that it, 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 it says you're getting to the price when it's the first year in the model that gets to a price that's closest to, but less than, right? And so you can see if you extrapolate these kinds of expectations, uh, for a long period of time, you get some really high numbers, but you can see here, right, a 25.5% compounded annual growth rate for almost 20 years. And the return on capital versus cost of capital spread goes from, you know, these days, you're still looking at something negative, um, whereas uh, here, you got to get up to 228%, right? So you're getting to a really high return on capital. That's because of the assumption in my model that the company is going to be able to grow, grow revenues and grow profits and have a high margin with zero capital expenditures. Wow. That's a stretch. So, <laughs> yeah, that, that's the whole point that I'm trying to make here. And it's been this way for a while is that, hey, great company, not necessarily a great stock. And, you know, it's not an argument that the meme stock types investors want to hear. You know, they just want to think it's going to go up forever because, hey, look, if it's made you a million dollars, why not make another million? So, Dave, can, am I wording it correctly? We're saying we're talking about the difference between the stock price and shareholder value. Yeah, that's one. Way, that's one way to put it. Um, you know, if, if you're defining shareholder value as really how much value can you reasonably expect the company to deliver in terms of profits? Mm -hmm. If that's what you mean, yeah, we're, we're yeah we're on the same page with that, right? Yeah. So I, I guess what I'm saying is the shareholder value who are going to receive the benefit of those future cash flows is essential. Maybe that would have been a better word. Yeah, yeah. yeah and, and look, it's complicated stuff, right? So the term and, and part of the problem is that Wall Street's cluttered this 
clutter the landscape with all kinds of terminology to make it difficult for you, right? I mean, that's what I think one of the, the biggest innovation for new constructs to the marketplace is that we're creating one version of the truth for profits, right? And what the Harvard and MIT guys did better business, and I'm very grateful to Charlie Wang, Ethan Ruen, and Eric So, these are the professors, because they, they came out and said, hey, look, everybody in the world's looking at earnings, and there are a lot of versions of earnings, but we found a new, better version. And by the way, their, their colleagues were not happy about this, Pete, right? Because there's 40 years of research based on the old versions. Mm -hmm. And, and the, the, the version that is, was the, the sort of most popular was CompuStat. And you can see in the paper, you know, they call out CompuStat for a lot of issues, as well as a lot of other different metrics from Capital IQ and Refinitiv, um, both historical metrics and Wall Street earnings. Uh, the, the takeaway being that with one version of the truth for profits, now people can go to one place that they can trust, as opposed to having to always try to, I, don't, I think, navigate the, the, the morass of different pro forma type of calculations that Wall Street and company analysts like to throw at people. And that's the thing like that most people don't realize is that there's a, just a lot of noise in these numbers, which is why, you know, an, another kind of cool thing about our site or, or, or uh, what, we, what we do now is that, you know, we've got specific strategies for people who want to do quant, quant strategies or quant trading, where you take the earnings distortion number that we calculate. And by the way, earnings distortion is core earnings, is, I'm sorry, is, is earnings distortion equals reported earnings minus core earnings, right? And reported earnings can be Wall Street numbers or it can be the gap numbers, right? Once you have earnings distortion, you can divide that by market cap or total assets and rank stocks based on that. And there are multiple studies that we have on our site that show you can generate significant returns, idiosyncratic alpha, right? By just going long the stocks where the distortion is negative, right? Where companies are understating their profits and shorting the stocks where the distortion is most positive or where earnings are most overstated. Three different studies on our site that document trading strategies. Uh, and kind of quick background, we had to do this because not enough quant funds were willing to read a 60 page paper from Harvard and MIT. Um, and the professors were more focused on proving the novel novelty of what it is we're doing. They had to show that no one else had discovered this because they effectively you know, for their business had discovered a new planet. Um, and they focused on that as opposed to trading strategies on how to monetize it. So we went to some other independent firms to provide trading strategies. Also free on our site for those of you who want to use it. And, and if you're on our site and you want to know about earnings distortion, you could see that, that under the ratings tab, you type in a ticker. First thing we're going to show, earnings distortion score, right? Miss means that... Um, we expect that they're more likely to miss than beat. And down here, we have a tab dedicated to earnings distortion, which will show you exactly sort of where we're getting to that, right? Earnings distortion is 43 cents a share, and that represents 14.33% of reported earnings and about 0.9% um, of total assets. Earnings distortion scores are based on earnings distortion divided by total assets. That's what the folks in the Harvard and MIT paper use to prove the idiosyncratic alpha in our data. And that's also the formula that a bunch of these independent firms use to uh, develop long short strategies that show idiosyncratic alpha. Some data here on reported gap earnings, earnings distortion and core earnings here to get a sense of what core earnings look like for um, companies like Tesla uh, or any company we cover for that matter. So all the details are there. And if you wanna go even deeper, our models, and this is available to institutional clients um, and is at a much higher price tag, but we've got details that show exactly how we're gonna calculate core earnings uh, and everything in our model. So um, every adjustment that goes into core earnings is here for people to see. Um, every adjustment that we make is here for all of our clients to see. One of the, I think you probably remember this, Pete, one of the hallmarks of new constructs is the 100% transparency into everything that goes into our models. That's this filings feature, which you can access in, through any, in, any, in, in any part of our model. Uh, and what this will show you is based on the land 
think they just had a quarterly filing come out last night, right? You want to see the data we parsed? Here it is, right? You want to see if there are any income statement adjustments? All we got is automotive regulatory credits, which you find on page 11 in the MDNA. Are there any balance sheet adjustments? Yeah, I got a couple things from the cash flow statement. Um, here's a pretext write down, which you can't find anywhere until note three, which is page 17. It's this kind of transparency that enabled Harvard, MIT, Ernst & Young, some of the biggest quant funds in the world, like Goldman Sachs Asset Management, uh, the professors at Indiana Kelly School of Business, to be willing to, to, to risk their reputation to write that our, or to prove that our data is better. Uh, I should say it didn't have to risk the reputation because everything's transparent and it's provable <laughs> because, because all of the adjustments we make can be traced right back to the footnotes and to the filings that we have parsed. We want our clients, Pete, we want our clients to know how much work we're doing for them. We share it. You don't get any of this from Wall Street. In fact, you don't get any of this kind of stuff from any other research firm because no one else has the technology to gather this data and no one else had the expertise to know what to do with the data once it was gathered. And, and so this is a really good time for people to discover new constructs because this paper from Harvard and MIT just came out. We just developed this earnings distortion score. We just rolled out all these ways to monetize earnings distortion. Uh, our stock picking success based on this research is, is kind of better than it's ever been. Um, and so, you know, and, and more and more people are also aware that there's, there's technology out there that can do work for them that they may have believed was impossible for them to get done on their own. Now you can pay someone a very, very, I think, um, a, very, a very, very minor fee to get access to the kind of research that you need in order to do your fundamental due diligence. Can you give a couple of examples uh, without maybe going too deep, but what would cause a distortion? Maybe high level, you don't have to get too deep. Oh yeah, no, we've got case studies on our site, Pete, like let's go um, back test data, data de details and case studies. So how about just reconciling um, core earnings to net income? Uh, we've got, let's see, seven companies in this example, and you can get access to the case studies in an Excel file if you'd like, so you can get more details. But um, here's an example for THMO, Sesca Therapeutics. And so what we do here is we'll show you every one of the adjustments and what page it comes from for the filing in the 2018 10K as an example here. Wow. Right? On page 46, we found the loss on disposal of equipment and leasehold improvements. Um, that was 1.4 million. Uh, 260,000 for restructuring and another 36,000 for restructuring on pages 28. Um, those are some examples uh, of those. Uh, let's see. Even just knowing the distortions could be fun to have somebody who does fundamental research just to look for them. That's right. That's right. Yeah. And that's, that's how Harvard Business School uses our, our paper in, their, in the class. So the professor uh, effectively, um, you know, the reason he got in touch with me is because kids didn't want to take the class anymore because they didn't think it was worth the time to spend on a, a class at Harvard Business School to learn how to read financial statements and footnotes because who cares about that? It's too much work. Nobody does it. And he got in touch with me because I had a technology that made the cost of acquiring that incremental data and footnotes zero, right? And then we prove that that incremental data and footnotes matters to stock prices. So now his class is extremely popular because he can show people how to get an edge at super low cost and quantify the value of that edge. Um, and yeah, so the way, the way they use it in the class is, is that before he introduces new constructs, right? He says, hey, uh, you know, I want you guys to go out and build these models to look at clean earnings and clean balance or what we call no pad and invested capital, um, net operating profit after tax and invested capital. And then once they go out and do it on their own, he says, okay, now I'm going to introduce you to new constructs. Compare your numbers to new constructs and show me where you think they did a better job or you did a better job. And then they get access to our website and they go in and, and, and check all that stuff out. But you see the big number here is this 33 million number for impairment charges. Uh, and this was actually on the income statement. So we always make a distinction between the stuff that's 
hidden, you can see here hidden, and stuff that's reported. So what is the implication that it's hidden? I guess that would be the obvious question. Uh, it just means you can't find it on the income statement. If you don't dig through the footnotes, you're never going to know. Wow. And, and look, the truth is, you know, the other data firms, legacy data firms, Pete, they only find, <laughs> the Harvard guys found, uh, proved that they only find about 30% of the stuff that's on the income statement. So our adjustments for reported items uh, are, are helpful, um, uh, but they find almost none of the stuff in the footnotes. Interesting. We do have a bunch of questions. I'm going to follow up with one question and maybe we could take, I, actually, there's two stocks that I think that might be interesting, if you don't mind. One is an, a very established company. And another one is a company that is very polarizing these days. One would be Microsoft, which reported and exploded. And the other one is Palantir, which I know a lot of members of our community are big fans of. And I think it'd be kind of cool to, there's such different ends of the universe. It would be kind of cool to go through those, the differences. Yeah, we are, we have, we have not, we have not um, analyzed the most recent uh, 10Q. I think it probably just came out. Um, yeah, it just went suspended yesterday. So okay. don't have the latest number. That should happen. Um, it'll probably be it'll probably be um, in the system tomorrow morning. Okay. But it's probably not going to change the numbers that much for uh, Microsoft. But you can see similar situation with Tesla here, uh, except it's not quite as expensive. Uh, but you've got super high quality earnings, super high return on invested capital, uh, and but a valuation that's starting to get a little bit rich. Uh, but a really, really good business. You know, I love seeing returns on capital up in the 40s. Look, that's a really impressive number for a company as big as Microsoft. It's been, it's done nothing but just generate a huge amount of cash flow. Uh, you can see it's got a positive free cash flow ratio, or sorry, uh, free cash flow yield. So it is generating free cash flow. You can see economic earnings just steadily going up, um, doing very well. Returns on invested capital, I mean, up and to the right, that's really impressive. Uh, margins doing well, capital turnover doing well. I think a couple of acquisitions here weighed the weighed the balance sheet efficiency down. Free cash flow yield um, doing fine, really weighed down uh, mostly because I think enterprise value and market cap's going up a bunch. But you can see, you know, uh, you know, it's just generating tons of cash flow. I mean, whereas you look at Tesla and they're losing a couple billion bucks a year. I mean, 9.7 billion, 27.3 billion, 39 billion, 32 billion. <laughs> um, it's an impressive, uh, super impressive business. And then Palantir, what's the ticker there? PLTR? PLTR. So not as impressive. You got a negative 66% return on capital. Um, economic earnings are bad, but so are reported earnings. And this column is really looking at the, at the differential between economic and reported earnings. So we care more about when they're moving in the different direction. So if they're both bad, it's not as much of a big deal. But look, yeah, I mean, this business is a long, long way from making any money, and yet it's valued as if it's gonna make a ton of money. Um, that's gonna get a bad rating in our system, right? Um, just because the fundamental risk reward is so large. We, thought, we like stocks that are making lots of money and the market expects them to lose money, <laughs> right? Um, we want to, you know, again, a difference between a good company and a good stock, and, and, and also a difference between a bad company and a bad stock, right? If the stock price implies the company is going to lose even more money than it's losing, well, that still could be a good stock, right? Because it's not as bad as the stock price implies. I love that quote, the difference between a good company and a good stock. That's a, that's a pretty powerful quote. Yep. Um, you know, I, I just think it's, 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 it's something to, to keep in mind for every investor. I mean, uh, it's not all about stock price. It's not all about earnings. It's a little bit of both. How would you define, has value investing changed with all the technological advances or is it still, we're just looking for companies with, with a moat that we could buy at a discount? I think value investing has changed enormously, honestly, with the advent of our technology, you know, one of the products that we market is sort of a value investing 2.0. Uh, the, if you look up, if you were to Google, value investing is dead. I mean, you're going to see hundreds of papers and articles. 
right, from some of the top firms in the business. And why is that? Because these firms have been using the same copy stat numbers for decades and the same ratios, ROE, price to earnings, EBITDA. And look, all the blood, all the alpha has been squeezed out of that turnip for a long time. That's precisely why we feel, you know, we're so excited about the novel alpha that we can bring to people, right? We've got a new proprietary perspective on fundamentals that's never been before uh, in the marketplace. Harvard and MIT and Ernst and Young have proven that no one else has this, right? I mean, 10 pages of that Harvard and MIT paper focuses on how the market has not yet impounded the effects of this new measure of core earnings and these unrealized gains and losses. So there's a new value factor in town. That's part of what we call this, uh, a new value factor, um, our novel factor, earnings distortion. And it's because technology is making it possible for investors to access data that they didn't have access to before. You know, and one of our bigger partnerships is with TD Ameritrade and they get uh, our high level ratings, right? So uh, when we were looking at, uh, at Tesla before or what any one of these stocks, right? We, we give access to just this overall number, none of the details behind it, right? And, and the messaging behind that partnership to their client base is we're leveling the playing field for the online investor. We're giving them access at least at a top level, right? To information that was previously available only to Wall Street insiders. Because let me tell you, having been on Wall Street, they know the real numbers. They coach the companies on how to manipulate the numbers because it's in their mutual best interest to sell more stock. And remember, they're in the interest, they're in the business of selling stock, right? <laughs> Probably one of the biggest conflicts of interest in the human, in human civilization, <laughs> right, is the fact that the people underwriting the sale of stock are also the ones providing ratings on the merit of that sale. Nowhere else in, in the world does that kind of conflict exist. Wow. Wow. So how about, if, Dave, if we go through one more stock, which actually has uh, a very attractive rating, BX, and then maybe we'll get into some questions. Yeah, Blackstone. So uh, super profitable business right? With a super low valuation. So one of my favorite metrics to kind of talk about valuation always is I love free cash flow yield. You love to see that. You love it like when it's just generating cash. That's a large percentage of the enterprise value of the business. That's great. But one of the ones that's easiest to kind of get your head around is this price to economic book value ratio when it's at a number like 0 0.7. Because a, a price to economic book value ratio of 1.0 means the market cap equals the no growth value of the business or the perpetuity value of the existing after tax profit or no pad, right? So when the market value equals the economic book value, that means the market believes the profits are going to stay the same forever. It's perfectly valued based on the perpetuity, perpetuity value of the existing profits. When the price to economic book value ratio is 0 0.7, the market price is implying that those profits will permanently decline by 30%. So when I told you before, we like stocks in, in companies that make a ton of money, 56% return on invested capital, higher than Microsoft. With valuations that imply they're going to lose money, it's not implying it's going to lose money, but it is implying that profits are going to decline by 30% permanently. That's good risk reward, right? Especially when you juxtapose it to something like Palantir, which is, miles away from making any money and has a valuation that implies it's going to make huge amounts of money. The other thing I'll show down here, benchmarks, right? So you can see how the scores for this, for, for Blackstone compares to the, the financial sector ETF, the S&P 500 and a small cap ETF. Um, just so you get a sense of benchmarks, right? So much higher return on capital than the sector and the S&P 500, um, better free cash flow yield, much better price economic book value and a better market applied growth appreciation period. So for people who want to sort of use ETFs as, a, as hedges, we can kind of give you a sense of, of where things stand for the overall ETF. Um, 
We also have sector research for that matter. So you can look at where how all the sectors stack up um, and then you can do more detailed dives into the overall sector or subsectors. And then of course we've got ratings on ETFs and mutual funds as well. Whoops, there we go. Yeah, so you can, you, you're able to understand and have insights at a aggregated portfolio level um, to the same degree that we provide on an individual stock level. What's your take on coin and hood? Two very unique business models that are obviously gaining in popularity right now. Yeah, um, you know, we've, we've written pretty extensively on both coin and hood. Um, we dislike them for different reasons. Uh, you know, we wrote, and we got a lot of coverage on our research on the coin IPO. Um, and we do, we, we do a lot of great IPO research. Uh, it's going to be very different than what you see from Wall Street. Um, and some of it's been super, super helpful. You know, I think, for example, um, our annualized return on the DD Global IPO was like, I think, 800% or something like that. So Coinbase, you know, look, nothing wrong with a business model, but the problem is, is, is evaluation. Uh, and so what we found with Coinbase is it basically, it's, it's valued as if it's going to be one and a half times the size, I think, of, of Schwab and E-Trade combined. Uh, no, Schwab, uh, no, New York Stock Exchange and, and, and uh, International, I'm oh, sorry, NASDAQ and New York Stock Exchange combined. So that, that's kind of the problem, right? Um, looks good now, but, you know, this is one of our favorite charts. Here's what their historical revenue has been. Here's what they got to do to justify 293 bucks a share. I don't know where it is now, right? And then here's where ICE and NASDAQ are combined. That's where Schwab's revenue is, right? So price for perfection is probably not a strong enough term, in my opinion, to describe how expensive Coinbase is on a fundamental basis. Wow. Uh, and then Hood. So the problem, the, you know, the real problem with Hood is, is that you know, it's effective, it's like, it's like cannibalism for investors, right? You make money by exploiting your fellow investors, right? Because Hood makes money by selling off your order flow to bigger investors so that they can front run those trades. So if you make money in Hood, you're effectively making money by Hood's kind of stealing from your fellow investors. Uh, and it's also valued, I think, as if its margin is going to be something like, let's see where our report is here. We've obviously got a lot of coverage here, interviews on what we did on, on, on Hood. Um, let's see here what the chart looks like. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I mean, you can see, you know, part of the problem with Hood is that it's just got way less assets and it doesn't have as many ways to monetize assets. The only way Hood makes money is order flow. And that's a bad thing, right? When you're making money doing wrong by your clients, I don't know if that's going to last. And that's kind of why, you know, one of our main points here is that it's a business model built on a conflict of interest. 81% of the revenue coming from payment for order flow. Not to mention all the lawsuits and settlements they've had to have because of the gamification of investing. I think another thing to keep in mind about Hood is that they're really bringing, you know, <laughs> The, the last tranche of, of online investors into the investing business, more sophisticated people have been doing it for a long time. You know, Schwab's kind of got a corner of the market on the best sort of individual investors you want to have as clients, right? People that understand index investing. They're not here to make short-term gains. They're not going to be volatile. They're not in and out. Um, the most profitable customers, Hood's bringing in the least profitable customers. And we saw that in the most recent earnings, Right. Um, they had a huge drop off. So yeah, their, their IPO price that their, their revenue was going to be 128% larger than, Sh than Schwab in 2020. Wow. Again, however good you think the company might be, I think the valuation might be a little bit ahead of itself. That's a staggering statement. Yeah. And here you can see implied revenue again in this chart. We love these charts, right? Cause it's kind of neat to like show, Hey, here's what it's done in the past right? Not a lot of revenue, not a lot of history. Here's what it's got to do in the future to justify 
Um, and that's just like, that's, you know, and again, this is where Schwab is. And they got to do that in 10 years when we wrote this. Took Schwab decades to get to where they are. And you don't think Schwab's got a moat around their business? You know, so to value. And that's getting, and that's getting there with people trading five shares. Right. <laughs> right. Right. You know, it, it, it makes no sense. It makes no sense. Okay. Why don't we hop over into some questions, Dave? Maybe um, I'll uh, actually, I'll start reading them off. Um, Dilip actually asked, when analysts give their price target estimates, what time frame are the predictions forecasted for? Um, for us, we don't really have always like a, a specific time frame. You know, again, I, I, I'm, I'm more critic of the market than I am a fortune teller. So I can't always tell you when our stuff's going to come true. Um, you know, look, if I could, if I got the timing right and the call right, uh, we, we'd all be doing this on, a, on my yacht. Right? <laughs> so um, I don't have a good answer for that one, to be honest with you. It's hard well, to actually, know. He's asking when Wall Street analysts give price targets. Oh, it's usually a 24, 12 to 24 month price target. Okay. A um, couple more questions about Tesla. It looks like they're the same question. Do you consider the sale of pollution credits in addition to the sale of cars for Tesla? And does that include federal credits continuing? I don't consider those recurring profits. And they're not selling, they're not selling pollution credits. They're, well, they are kind of, they call it pollution credits. Yeah, they've been selling a lot of those. Um, we don't consider it part of recurring profits because they're going away because those companies are no longer polluting as much. They're all shifting to EV, which also means there's a ton, a lot of competition has already come, already come online. We've seen Tesla's market share shift from 76 to I think 56% in the US, uh, even less in Europe. And so as, those, those, as companies produce more, as competitors produce more EVs, they're gonna need less regulatory credits. Um, so it's kind of a double whammy on, on the earnings side there. So question from Brian, when do these numbers actually catch up to the stock price? I think we kind of covered that a little bit with the price implied time frame, right? That's right. And that was what I was answering before when you asked me about timing on target prices. Yeah, it's hard for me to know exactly when they're going to catch up. Sometimes it catches up in a short amount of time. Sometimes like Tesla, who knows when. Um, you know, I think in some cases... Pete, like for me, it's like, it, it depends on when maybe the general awareness of the investment community knows about things like core earnings. Um, you know, I think that's partly why you're doing your clients and your community a big service by getting them in, getting, getting them in front of what we do sooner rather than later so that they can at least position portfolios to be somewhat ready for it, even if it's months or years before the rest of the market catches on, um, they're ahead of the curve. I think something that, you, you know, even just from a where you're allocating your portfolio or where you're allocating your money, which is a big part of what we do, is, is that actually a good idea? Just this chart that you have on the screen and what it's implying of what Hood needs to do, comparing it to Schwab, which is a very well-established company, you have to say to yourself, what are the, and the big terminology we use is, what are the odds of that actually happening? Is that, is, am, I, am I simplifying that down too much? But isn't that what that's? basically saying here? It's exactly right. It's a risk reward, right? Like the odds of the company meeting the expectations in the stock price get increasingly lower, get lower and lower, the more that stock gets disconnected from its fundamentals. That's okay, a, great a couple more here. I'm going to, I'll read them off. Uh, isn't the key issue when and how long it takes for real cash flow analysis to be reflected in the stock price? And I think the answer to that is, yeah, right. That is the point. Yes. And then I think the second part of the question here is, I think part of the problem with a lot of people with Tesla is a lot of people have an emotional attachment to Tesla, whether it's to Elon Musk or a deeper, further belief. Oh, yeah. And I think the fact that the stock has made them so much money, <clears throat> you know, is part of the attachment as well. Um, and let's face it, look, we got a lot of emotional investors out there. You don't have to look long and hard on the internet for YouTube videos, worshiping the stock price, coming up with explanations that are some of which are really far-fetched to justify the valuation. I've done some long form interviews with Rob Maurer, Tesla daily podcast, the big, one of the biggest Tesla bulls out there, you know, going toe to toe with them on all this kind of crazy theories on how to justify the valuation back when the stock was at four or 500 bucks 
and none of them hold water. Um, <clears throat> but, you know, here we are at a thousand. So go figure. A uh, question from Dalip. Do you find fundamental analysis correlates better for old school, lower volatility stocks than growth stocks? Well, I think yes. I would say just at the top of growth stock and a old school stock is different. Growth stock by itself is a different category, you know? Yeah, no, I, I think I think you're safer, right? And so one of the things that we found in our in our um, back test studies of how to monetize earnings distortion is that for the mega cap companies, which are kind of the, a lot of these growth story stocks, earnings distortion doesn't work as well. Uh, for smaller cap companies, it works better. So even for the growthy names, it's it's where the markets are, or the stocks are, are owned by sort of less emotional investors. Uh, less story stocks because let's face it, if it's the story stock then it's the story driving the stock. So we got a question here. I think I can answer the context. Is John is asking adding fundamental analysis to what we do, which is order flow trading, um, can that help us rank our stock picks? And another follow up question here by Andrew, basically around the same thing. And I'm going to say no in the context that what we do is in much shorter time frame. What we're talking about here with David tonight is the fundamentals of the company over a longer period of time. So it's not really, David's not necessarily picking stocks as much as brutally analyzing the fundamentals of where it is now and what the stock price is being implied and how it has to catch up to that. Is that, is that a better way to say it? Yeah, you know, look, I, I don't know y'all's strategy, right? So if it's super short term, we can't be as helpful. But for right. longer term stuff, I think, yes. Um, you know, anything that's longer term. And our, our signals is is not as fast as signals order flow. Order flow, yeah. I think, is like mother of all signals. Like if you know what's going to happen in the market before it happens, you know, ride that ride that horse all day long. Yep. And I think that's one of the biggest reasons that I, and, you know, truth be told, I've been hounding Dave for a while to have this conversation with us tonight because we do have a lot of investors in our community, which is different from what we do, which is why I wanted to add this conversation to what we're already doing to expand our knowledge to be making better decisions. All right. Uh, let's see. I want to go to another one. Uh, does your analysis have comparative analysis? In other words, how similar companies are doing in the sector? I know you went over sectors and industry groups. Yeah. So you, you, our, our portfolio tracking tool can let you put together whatever groups of stocks you want here. And by the way, you can have stocks, ETFs, mutual funds all ranked next to each other. So you can, you can design whatever portfolio you want. You can have as many as you want many different portfolios as you like. Well, depending on the level of service, right? Gold, our gold service, you get 25 tickers and you get one portfolio. The higher levels of service get more tickers and more portfolios. Uh, but yes, you can do these comparisons at this level. Um, and then you can do, th you know, you can look at things also at, at, a, at a sector level. Um, and just and do those kinds of rankings. So yeah, the, all the data is, is there. So you can pretty much do everything you, you want. Um, it's hard for me to get more specific than that because I don't know necessarily exactly what the question is. Yep, yep. So, that, so David brings up a good point. Um, so for 401ks, this is more useful for long-term than what we do where we're a little bit more actively trading the week-to-week -week sector rotation, the month-to-month -month sector rotation. Absolutely. Absolutely. 401k absolutely would be great because especially if you only have access to mutual funds, you can, you know, go into our system and, you know, type in that mutual fund ticker and, and get a rating. We also have a screener for mutual funds um, that you can ETS and mutual funds. So if you wanted to <clears throat> find all the mutual funds that, uh, you know, have an attractive or very attractive rating with more than 500 million in AUM, uh, uh, you know, go. And you get a list, you know, immediately. Uh, if you want them to be more technology um, or let's say energy related, there's your list. Only two, right? Um, anyway, you get the idea. It can be done very quickly. Okay, awesome. Uh, so what I think I want to do, David, is I want to invite everybody to uh, at the very least get started tonight because I know I've been on the site for at least the last six months and if I'm not mistaken, the gold membership, you can you build a portfolio of 25 stocks that updates every 30 days or something like that. That's right. Every quarter, you get to put in 25 different stocks. Um, stocks, ETFs, to mutual funds. Yep. And here's the, here's, here's the page to 
to get a sense of what it is we offer. Um, you can sign up monthly, annually, risk free for 30 days. We'll give you a refund if you don't, if you want it, if you don't, if you decide after within 30 days that you don't like it. Uh, you can do a tour of the site before you use it. We've got great video tours. Again, we're transparent. We want you to have a, have a look at what it is we're doing. Uh, we're very proud of the work we do. We're not trying to sucker anybody in. That's why we'll give you your money back if you don't like it. Uh, you got to let us know within 30 days, of course. Um, and then we'll give you a tour, of course. I mean, it's, it's all transparent. Every doing, everything we do in our community is up-leveling what we're doing right now. We're never satisfied. And a lot of what we do is on the shorter time frame, one, you know, one week to one month to one quarter. And I would strongly suggest everybody who's in our community to at least get started with the gold membership. It's, what is it, $49 or something like that, Dave, to kick it around for a month? 49 bucks a month. I, so I posted the link in here tonight. I'd suggest everybody do it. And just for full transparency, I'm doing this just because I want everybody to learn. There's no other thing going on behind the scenes here. I asked David to come on to expand our knowledge, to open our eyes up to a couple of different things. I'm actually a member uh, of the service and I use it pretty much. I'm on there every single day. So what I'd like to do, especially members of our community, is get started, make the investment in yourself of $49. And this is going to open up a whole bunch of other conversations that we can have in the community on top of what we're already good at. Um, and then maybe we can ask Dave even to come back at some point in the future and we could have some more, um, more directed questions when we're a little bit more familiar with how to ask you better questions, maybe for the next time, it might be a good way to word it. Absolutely. Right. If this, this, this works out well, we'll figure out a way to get some volume discounts, things like that for your community. Okay. Uh, I guess we'll throw it out there one more time. If anybody has any other questions, pop them in there now. If not, we'll, uh, we'll call it a night. Thank David for his time. And then we'll, um, we'll have the replay available for everybody, but make sure you get started tonight because there's a ton of information in there. And it's a much, much different way of looking at the market than what you're going to see the first time somebody spits out an earnings per share number. And you think you want to make a decision off of that. Uh, looks like everybody's saying thank you, David. So I think we caught you. You did a good job of going as, over as much as possible. I can virtually guarantee you, though, that we're going to have some follow up after this when we have some more conversations in the community. And the way we usually do our coaching calls, is we, we put them in the forum and have everybody just post all of their questions. This way, if we have you come back, so maybe sometime in the future, it's basically just reading the questions. So it's as opposed to people putting in questions at the last minute. And it's a very organized way of doing it. OK, sounds all right. great. All right, everybody. Have an awesome night. David, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. And I'll speak thank to you, you soon. Thank you. Nice to meet everybody. Take care now.